all. Good morning, all. Um, I'm excited to be here with you. Uh, this has been a really beautifully organized conference, and I'm just really honored, um, well, to follow the former prime minister, and uh, and just to have this a beautiful turnout. And um, I hope I can inspire you with some really out of the box solutions today. <coughs> <coughs> So we've talked a lot about problems and um, solutions for Barbados and the islands. But now I want to show you something a little different. Because now we're going to go and do a little bit of dreaming. Does that go? Yeah, a little dream. A little dream about what could be different in the future. So uh, I want to start with a little bit of story uh, to give you a little perspective on where I'm coming from. Uh, it's a little different from where most of you come from because I'm probably the only biologist in the room. And um, my father was an architect and his specialty was on zoos and aquarium. So he actually was one of the designers uh, for SeaWorld with the new, um, uh, they had a, a brand new um, idea for making these glass tunnels where the sharks would swim through. And it was considered really groundbreaking at the time. So my dad would take me to SeaWorld uh, behind the scenes to um, watch the sharks while he you know, measured with the foreman and talked about all this. And of course, I'm, I was maybe eight years old. So I would run around and scamper on the little planks that went over the, uh, the, the shark tanks. And you know, they'd cruise around underneath me. Nobody was watching me. But, and they were really close. You could touch them, and sometimes I did. Um, but what I was really struck by was that these animals had been around for 400 million years, and their sharkness really hadn't changed that much. The, the, the nature of a shark is pretty much the same as it was 400 million years ago. So in my mind, that is the ultimate in sustainability. Uh, and that's really stuck with me ever since then. The other um, exhibit that he worked on that really sticks in my mind is the penguin exhibit. And now this place was really groundbreaking. And they had this idea for melting the ice at one end of the exhibit and then it would go through these filters and then freeze again at the other end and circulate. And it sounded so cool, but of course it broke right away. <laughs> and uh, so my dad gets this panic call in the middle of the night. You've got to come over to SeaWorld and spray these penguins down with some snow, um, some ice. They need ice right away. So um, my dad wakes me up, it's like three in the morning, and he's like, you've got to come with me to SeaWorld. We're going to hose down some penguins. So, I mean, it's a dream come true for an eight-year-old. Um, so, <laughs> so we get there, and they give us these big hoses, and, and, um, and, and I was struck, like, looking at the penguins, you know, on land, they were so incompetent. They would just flop over and, like, s scoot on their bellies, and they really weren't very good at it at all. Um, I, th I thought, God, they've lost so much of their birdness to live in this Antarctic environment. Um, but then, when they would go into the water, like in this picture, um, you see that they are just exquisitely designed for their habitat. And they would speed around and grab fish, and they were amazing. So that was really interesting to me to think about how much an, an organism could change to suit its habitat. But the thing that stuck out to me most from that whole experience was that before we could go into the exhibit, we had to step into these pans of this green goo and uh, step into them, and then we could go into the exhibit. And I was like, what was this for? And they said that the microorganisms in our world would instantly kill um, these penguins. And that really made an impression on me um, that after all these millions of years of these birds surviving in you know, negative 40 degrees out in the Antarctic, uh, that we could wipe them up with just a single stupid microbe on the bottom of our shoe. And it made me realize how vulnerable um, these organisms were to us. And it, it really gave me um, kind of a, uh, uh, a mindset of, of, uh, that, that humans were destructive and that our uh, designs were um, doomed to fail and that, um, you know, nature was perfect as long as we stayed out of the picture um, and there wasn't a lot of hope for us. So um, I, and oh, <laughs> and at the time I wanted to be an architect and my dad said, you can do anything you want to do in life, anything you want, except for be an architect. 
because it's a terrible job. <laughs> so I became a biologist instead. And, um, and, and that's, that served me well. Um, So what I ended up doing in evolutionary biology, I've, I've actually had a lot of great adventures over the course of doing this. I started out in uh, studying plant biology in the forests of Santa Cruz. Um, I've studied whales in Madagascar and the Alaskan Sea. Um, I've studied uh, human evolution in Ethiopia and um, uh, baboons, chimpanzees, you name it, I've studied it. And then over time, um, I became really interested in these social structures and how um, different social structures evolve and what they could accomplish. And so that's led me into honeybees and ants and all these really ancient societies that are solving the same kind of complicated problems that we do um, with, with ways that we, we don't expect. And so it's become a really uh, interesting um, circular uh, thing. And then I've ended up now in the corporate world where I'm teaching corporations how to do all these things. And so. Um, you know, I, I think that what we've concluded after all this is that wild ecologies, the nature around us, is really the best and maybe only uh, example that we have um, for, for what a sustainable world could look like. And so it's a source of inspiration to us, but it's also, to me, gives me a lot of hope because I know that these solutions work. They've evolved before and they're there and we don't have to reinvent the wheel and it's not impossible because it's already been done. And so I wake up each morning saying, I know this is possible and all we have to do is crack the code um, and, and we can have a world like this of abundance. So, um, so, so now, you know, you know, nature's this beautiful symphony of, of, of all kinds of um, diverse relationships and that's really the world that we would like to see. Um, and I think that we do have the ingredients to get there. So I'm going to take you on a little journey, a little eco journey, and see if we can create that here in Barbados using this kind of inspiration. And I, I realize this probably sounds a little far out to you at the moment, you know, in your worlds of development and, and sales and in the day-to-day -day life, but um, I, I really feel like this is becoming uh, the forefront of um, what, what, what is in store for us. Um, in order to get to the sustainable world that we, that we wish we had. So uh, part of what happened to me, so I came into it thinking, mm, nature, uh, you know, humans, we're gonna just screw everything up. This is just not good. Um, we're, we should really just jump off cliffs like lemmings, let the rest of nature have it. This is just, you know, not a good plan. But over time, I've actually had a real sea change in my way of thinking. And I've realized that, you know, um, we are just other animals. We are part of nature. And we have a, a place in our ecologies. And we're doing things some very strange ways that are not sustainable, but there's no reason why that has to be. So really, we're just fancy apes um, solving problems in some different ways. And uh, I think, I think we're, we're close to the tipping points where we can really make a sea change difference in the way we do this. So um, the, the approach I've taken to this is something called biomimicry. And I don't know how many of you have, are familiar with biomimicry, heard of it, know a little bit about it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's starting to get out there. Um, but basically the idea is that if 30 million species on Earth and all of them have invented these solutions uh, for solving the same kind of problems we do. I mean, here we have a gecko, and it sticks, and it's temporary sticking. It can, it can move. How does it do that, and wouldn't we like to have that kind of technology? Um, and now we've been able to study that in the lab, figure out how they do that, and we've actually invented a tape that accomplishes the same thing. Uh, and so biomimicry is, is, acquire, is a, a, a designing these kinds of processes um, and products every day now. And, uh, and that's mostly what I'm doing with companies today. Um, and so what we found is that uh, there's you know, 30 million species in existence today, and all of them are survivors. So every living species today, including everyone in this room, has had 3.8 billion years of ancestors that successfully solved the problems um, of the past. So all of us are survivors, all of us um, can give each other a little pat on the back. I mean, 
It's really quite remarkable. We're the survivors. So, you know, 99.9% .9 of all the species that ever lived are now gone. And so we represent uh, the 0.1% um, that are left. And if you think about it, you know, what could we learn from that 0.1% um, about doing things a better way? And, uh, and increasingly, we're finding out that, that there's an awful lot that they can teach us. So this slide, I was just trying to show you how, um, how we're doing some things, some very odd ways that other species have not tried before. And um, what specifically comes to mind for me is digging up fossilized sunlight from yesterday and putting it in cars and making it into plastic that nothing can eat. And that seems, you know, um, oh, you know, what a hopeless species. What are they thinking? You know, what are our children going to say? What, what, what were you thinking about doing that? Um, but, but in reality, if, as an evolutionary biologist that looks at these vast uh, timelines of geology, I know that eventually something will come along that eats that plastic. And I know that this economy will become circular again. But do we have that long to wait? And what about all the toxic chemicals that we have in that plastic? You know, um, and so we, we really, and, and we just don't have that much time. And I think the main problem that we're facing now is, of course, climate change. Uh, and that gives us a very short timeline um, for fixing. So it's, it's important to start looking at uh, how do these other species and these other ecosystems solve the problems compared to what we're doing, and, and how far is that gap? And how can we get from there to here? Uh, and I, I do believe that that gap is, is crossable. Um, and I do also think it's going to happen faster than we think. So here's biomimicry, um, if, you haven't, if you don't know much about it. And it's really just looking at the forms um, of other species in nature and seeing what we can copy from them, what we can learn from them. Um, and, you know, these are very efficient solutions. They're all um, uh, made at room temperature with uh, local materials, um, local water, local, you know, usually grown from the sun. Um, they, um, they're, they're sustainable um, and they're clever. And uh, we, we've got a lot, you know, that we can learn from them. So um, this is my bird slide because we have to have the lessons from the birds and the bees. I started with the bees, these are the birds. Um, so these are nature's proven successes. And now this, this, term, this, uh, this uh, field of biomimicry is fairly new, um, but it's hot right now. It's just exploding. If you were to Google <clears throat> biomimicry right now, you would see um, just an exponential curve on the number of uh, papers that are coming out on it, the number of products and patents. It's, it's really exciting. <clears throat> and Fortune, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Fortune Magazine just called it the number one trend in business for 2017. Um, and so for me personally, all of a sudden I'm getting a million phone calls uh, from companies that want to have this. And, and you know, companies like Google are looking at uh, changing the entire DNA of their, their um, whole mission statement and, and the way they do everything based on these ways because we know they work. These things have persisted for 3.8 billion years. These are proven winners. Um, and these companies want to pe have a piece of that. Oh, thank you so much. It's got my own lipstick on it. It must be mine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, here's a quote from Steve Jobs. It says, the biggest innovations of the 21st century will be at the intersection of biology and technology. A new era is beginning. And I really believe that's true. Um, we're going to start to see so much crossover. Um, and in an interdisciplinary excitement that's going on. But now the weird thing that happens is, I don't know how many of you in this world are bio uh, room are biologists. Um, hey, we got two, three, woohoo! See, the world's changing right before our eyes. But usually I'm the only one in the room. <laughs> but I do think it's important that we get more transdisciplinary. We find that edge where we get wild um, nature uh, informing our solutions so that we can do some really exciting things. Um, I even wrote a book about it. This is my book, Teaming, that just came out in July. Um, I enjoyed 15 minutes of fame. Um, it hit, it's, a, it's an Amazon bestseller. Woo! Yes, yes. 
<laughs> so uh, I, I encourage you to check it out. It, it goes through organizational design and how we can reinvent products, um, sales models, everything you could possibly think of. Um, and, it, and, and I hope you, I hope you check it out. Um, so, and again, this 99.9% .9 of innovation in nature has failed. All these, all these creatures have gone extinct over four billion years. And the 0.1% uh, that are left, imagine what we can learn from them. It's very exciting. Um, and I just wanted to give you some examples um, that specifically pertain to changing our world, making our world more sustainable, um, dealing with climate change, dealing with the problems that we have. Because I think that these um, concepts can get very abstract, um, but really they're grounded in real problems that are happening today, uh, and they're actually helping us. Um, everybody knows about solar panels, um, but did you know that the dye-sensitive uh, panels that we're using today were inspired by this particular species? This was a single specimen of um, native Hawaiian hibiscus that was discovered on one island. Uh, and when they, we brought it in the lab and tried to bring it back, they discovered that it had a very large um, photo molecule, um, much larger than other uh, plants, and they were able to discover um, uh, the photosynthetic pathway and visualize it in a way they never had before. And from that, they were able to emulate that into the current um, Dysol uh, uh, PV that we use today. Um, so, you know, not only did we save a species from extinction, but that one species gave us something that's, that's going to give back to us. Um, and, and I'm sure there's so many more examples out there that we just don't even know about. Right here, we're looking at a morpho butterfly. And it turns out that if you look very closely at the wings, you see that it has these uh, little structures on them that actually focus light um, and heat energy from solar energy and actually power the butterfly. So now we've been able to take these structures and add them to our uh, PV um, structures to increase the efficiency of light um, that we use on the PV. So, um, unexpected source of innovation, and these things are all around us all the time. Um, and then thinking about um, the uh, uh, trees, um, you know, here we are really talking about designing a new city, smart cities, and you know, what about a tree? It's rooted in place, it has to make everything it has from the available sky and soil uh, that it has um, available to it. And how does it do that? You know, it, it, it really has to be efficient and shaped. And, and yet our buildings, you know, we, we pipe in energy from some grid and we take water from, you know, the Grand Canyon or, you know, whatever. Um, and nature isn't doing that. It has to do everything locally. And so that's something that I think that to really scale up our sustainability, we're going to have to start really looking hard at this and, and keeping things local. So, um, we've got that. They're rooted in place. They have to make it work where they are. Um, and they, they create habitat for all kinds of other creatures. And, and that could be, you know, um, the creatures that live in, in them. And it could, be, uh, um, it could be as a metaphor for our own human societies. You know, how many opportunities are we making for other businesses um, with our companies and our buildings and our cities? And then last, I wanted to say that beneath all the forests, 95% of the plants on Earth are supported by these mycelial networks. This is a fungal network that's everywhere underground. And what these things are doing is taking um, nutrients and water and signals, and they're moving them between the trees. So they're feeding trees that need more nutrients. And in exchange, the trees give them sugars. So really, they're all the forest is connected like a telephone system and an internet and an irrigation system. Um, and it's really quite remarkable. Um, and, and that's you know, really where we're headed, I think, um, in, a, in, a, in a metaphorical sense, but also in a real biological sense. So these are all models that are, that are worth looking at um, for the cities that we would like to have uh, in the future. And they're resilient to disruption, you know, especially um, I think in the Caribbean, you know, we're all thinking about climate change and hurricanes and drought 
and these um, really extreme weather events. And the plants that uh, evolved here are well adapted to them. You know, the palm trees, um, they split their leaves, they let the wind go through them, they moderate sunlight, they moderate um, heat so that they can maximize their photosynthesis. And these are all lessons that we can use um, just by watching them. So why can't our cities function like living organisms? And that, that seems kind of like a radical statement, um, but really it's not a matter of why can't they, but when will they? Because if they don't, it's not gonna work for us. We need to become part of these ecosystems that we find ourselves in. And I'm not saying that from some hippy-dippy, I wish you know nature was all around us perspective. What I'm saying is that until we can all connect with the uh, external environment and make it one ecosystem, we cannot surf for free on the synergies that nature has been cultivating for four billion years. Um, there's a reason why these ecosystems are so rich, and it's because they work together. Uh, and, and we can do the same thing. In fact, we have to. Um, you know, what if nature, uh, what if our built environment could do all these things? What if we just use local materials? What if we uh, used available waste streams? Um, what if other creatures uh, lived on the waste that we produce? Um, and what if they responded and adapted to the environment the same way the trees do? And uh, what if they sheltered other species um, and other people and gave them opportunities that they didn't have before? I mean, isn't that what we want for our cities? Isn't that what we want for Bridgetown 2030? Um, to me, this is very exciting, and, it, and I, it seems a little far out, probably, to many of you, but, but real people are thinking about these things, and, and I do believe that the solutions are there. Um, here's some examples. You know, when we're talking about climate change, um, we end up talking about mitigating it. You know, oh, let's build a seawall. Let's keep our fingers crossed. You know, let's build an emergency system. But that's really not what nature's doing um, to solve this. You know, if you look at the coral reefs all around here, you know, they're building cement. Um, structures, just as we are doing. But how do they do it? You know, we cook the cement in a kiln for, at 100 degrees. We use 10% uh, of the world's emissions are, 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 built, are, are being used for concrete and cement. Um, and it's, it's quite a process. And then we ship it somewhere else. But the coral reefs are not doing that. What they do is they use the atmospheric carbon that's dissolved in the water. They bind it to a calcium ion, and they actually make it on site. In, in water um, at room temperature. And, uh, and there's really no reason why we can't do it. In fact, there's a company in California called Calera that is doing exactly that. Uh, and so these are carbon neutral, or carbon negative buildings that are actually absorbing carbon from the air. And that seems like the logical way to go. You know, trees, what do they make? What, are, what is a tree built on? It's built on carbon from the air. Um, and that's really the way nature works. Um, carbon in the air is, is what makes food. It's what makes a coral reef. These are building blocks. This is a huge resource for us. It's not the enemy. Um, and so we need to think our, change our thinking about this and turn this into something really exciting. Um, waste products, the circular economy. The mushrooms have been doing it for 2.5 billion years. Um, digesting other species, recirculating them, um, and turning them into something new, upcycling them. And, uh, and so these are proven technologies um, that have served our Earth for billions of years. And uh, I, I feel that you know, we're in a position to where we can, we can take um, our Earth and our people to another level um, and do something similar that's really a game changer that makes um, more abundance, richness for all of us. Um, the answers are there. Uh, symbiosis, working together. Now this is something that's really exciting to me and I don't know if any of you um, know the company Regenesis. Um, I know they've done some work in Barbados. But one of their things that they do is they look for synergies. They look for these places where people are working on all kinds of problems, but can we find places 
where we can sync up and make synergies that make more um, than we thought, uh, more than the, the sum of the parts. And so look in the, uh, in the coral reef, you have an algae and it partners up with a coral animal. And then the coral animal is producing waste um, and it's producing carbon dioxide when it exhales. And the plants live on, the algae lives on that carbon dioxide and it lives on that waste as fertilizer. Together, it's a circular system that creates the entire coral reef, which is the richest, um, most diverse habitat on Earth. That's a synergy point, and those are the kind of points that we want to find um, in, in, in the audience here. You, all of you are looking for networking opportunities where you can make more than you ever could on your own. And I think that's the way that we're going to achieve these things. Um, the lichen is another one. You know, this is an algae and a fungus working together. And the algae produces photosynthesis, sugars from the sun, um, but the fungus provides it a home. And it also makes these acids that dissolve the rock. And together, they create soil. And the soil is where the seeds of other plants blow into and grow and create whole new ecosystems. So again, a synergy point that creates life, conduces, conditions conducive to life for an entire ecosystem. So uh, creating abundance and wealth that was never there before, uh, just from these synergies. Uh, and then the services that, that nature provides, you know, um, it stores carbon, it cleans the air, it purifies the water, um, you know, and uh, we think, well, you know, that's a beautiful, ocean, that's a beautiful you know, um, pond over there, that's a beautiful forest. But really, they're actually doing things for us that we are not paying for. They do it for free. Um, and why shouldn't our buildings and our cities provide those same um, services for us? You know, um, here's an example. This is the uh, Bank of America building in New York City. And air that leaves this building is three times cleaner than the air that goes in. So it's producing the same kinds of services that a tree would. And why couldn't we do that ourselves? And now imagine a whole ecosystem of these buildings like trees networked together. What if all of New York was networked together like that, sharing um, uh, excess you know, nutrients and water and, and everything they need? Um, with some kind of digital network that's, that's not unlike the mycelial networks underground. To me, this is really exciting, and it's, it's not the future anymore, it's here. This is a Namibian uh, beetle, Namibian darkling beetle, and it lives in the Namibian desert, and there's no water there, it never rains. So what they do each day is they go out and they climb up a little hill and they stick their bums up in the air and they have these bumps on it and the bumps attract uh, fog from the air. And then they have these little rivulets between the bumps that collect the water and then the water drips down right into their mouths. So a neat little system. Um, but now people have uh, copied this to create um, the uh, Sahara Project which is a, a project that is actually growing plants in the Sahara Desert and re-desertification, uh, uh, fighting desertification there. So they're actually growing plants in places that have no water um, with, with a technology that mimics this little beetle. So all these ideas from nature are all around us and super exciting and they can really regenerate abundance um, that we thought we couldn't have. Uh, and then disturbance and resilience. And you know, this is a real um, touch point for the entire Caribbean. Um, all these hurricanes you know, and, and droughts and extreme weather events. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do about this? You know, can we, can we just, are we just stuck mitigating it? Or, or is there something we can do about it? And we've talked about the carbon sequestration and trying to reverse it, and I will say, that there is a real effort, and it's super exciting, that for the Caribbean, um, and actually Barbados in particular, to become the hub, the vanguard for this carbon sequestration uh, climate reversal um, effort. And it is based on biomimicry. There's a huge influx of biomimicry coming in. And so we're gonna see, I think, a lot more education for the youth, 
um, a lot more uh, getting them out into nature so that they can learn from the ecosystems that are already learn, uh, working here and see what they can do. Because all, all of our knowledge, all of our assets are already here for us. So this is actually my hometown, um, not so resilient. We, we got a little flood problem. <laughs> uh, but what we found is, you know, that coastal buffers are the answers. Mangroves, um, oyster beds, uh, coral reefs, um, all of these things mitigate uh, and, and, and help um, soften that blow from those, those storms. And that's what we need to do is restore those ecosystems that are providing those services for us for free. And, they, and they're so synergistic with our tourism and everything else. So all of these answers are things that we can do, you can do. Um, and, and I really think it's rooted in the children, it's rooted in the, la the, uh, the local assets that we have, um, the, uh, the maker instinct, we're all driven to make something, um, and I, I think that's really exciting. Um, you can, uh, uh, we can co-create with nature, and that's the other thing, is that nature is not something that we are breaking necessarily. We can work with it, and we have to work with it. We have to participate within it, because we are part of nature. We are part of these ecosystems, and there's so much we can do with nature to, to make it work for all of us, to make something richer. And I think it's really important to say, especially you know here where you're bringing in so much outside expertise, that all the assets are here. You have the youth here. You have the knowledge here. Um, you have so much diversity and exciting things here. All of the answers are here, and that includes the nature. All you have to do is look at the children and get them to the beach, get them to these ecosystems, get them inspired, get them learning about bi biomimicry, and, and telling them, you know, if you learn these things, you can apply them to these solutions. Um, and, and, and this is a, a Regenesis, is the group that I work with, and, and some of their solutions that they've used to actually get whole communities together to really create more, and it's, it's really exciting. I'd actually love to talk more about this, but I'm, I'm out of time. Um, but this is the last thing I wanted to leave you with, is, you know, there's been talk about storm walls and that sort of thing, and this is Blackpool in England. And on the top picture you can see is what they did is, uh, when the storm started coming in, you know, um, they built this huge ugly wall and it cut the town off from their main asset, which was the beach. And now they've taken all that away. The town died as a result. I mean, they really lost their whole industry. And now they've replaced it with this synthetic dune, which is steps that gradually um, dissipate the, the, the wave water. Um, it acts as a dune. It is, basically it's a synthetic dune, and it, it, it is reconnected the people with the town that they love. Uh, and it's all about love. It's all about love. If you can fall in love with your place, I think that uh, you'll find that it's going to naturally create those synergistic, symbiotic points that bring you together where you can surf for free uh, on the energy of each other. And all of a sudden, all kinds of solutions start to happen that you never thought could. Um, and right here, you know, dreaming our next city into, be into being begins with a simple question. What would nature do here? And I have to say, nature is doing it here every single day. And you're it. And I hope that you can collaborate with the, the wild nature and the tame nature inside you and make something really exciting. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much.